Hello, welcome to the session on concept of the soul. Among the Western philosophers, the ancient Greeks provided much insight into the nature of the soul. Two paradigmatic viewpoints were articulated by the philosophers Plato and Aristotle. Plato, drawing on the words of his teacher Socrates, considered the soul as the essence of a person which is an incorporeal, eternal occupant of our being. After death, the soul is continually reborn in subsequent bodies. For Plato, the soul comprises three parts, each having a function in a balanced and peaceful life. The logos, superego, mind, nose or reason. The logos correspond to the character directing the balanced hoses of appetite and spirit. It allows for logic to prevail and for the optimization of balance. The thymos, emotion, ego or spiritedness. The thymos comprises our emotional motive or ego that which drives us to act of bravery and glory. If left unchecked, it leads to hubris, the most fatal of all flaws in the Greek view. The pathos, appetitive, id or carnal. The pathos equates to the appetite, id, that drives humankind to seek out its basic bodily needs. When the passion controls us, it drives us to hedonism in all forms. In the ancient Greek view, this is the basal and most feral state. Although Aristotle agreed with Plato that the soul is the core essence of a being, he argued against its having a separate existence. Unlike Plato, Aristotle did not consider the soul as ghostly occupant of the body. According to him, the soul is an actuality of a living body and thus it cannot be immortal. Aristotle describes this concept of the soul in many of his works such as the De Anima. He believed that there were four parts or powers of the soul. The calculative part, the scientific part on the rational side used for making decisions and the desiderative part and the vegetative part. On the rational side responsible for identifying our needs. Pre-Pythagorean belief was the soul had no life when it departed from the body and retired into Hades with no hope of returning to a body. The main precursor of the modern concept of mind is the ancient Greek notion of soul psyche which was originally used to mark the difference between things that are alive and things that are dead. Conceptually, it was related to breath pneuma and was thought to come in degrees corresponding to different states of consciousness. Thus, a dead man was said to have lost his psyche entirely whereas a sleeping or fainting man has lost enough of it to lose consciousness. Although that too would bring him a step closer to death, the soul is composed of extremely light and tenuous matter variously identified with pure and breathable elements such as air as by the philosopher's tales 625 to 547 BCE and Anaximenes 570 to 500 BCE or fire by Heraclitus 540 to 480 BCE. Most pre-Socratic thinkers would have understood the expression, he breathed his last, literally, and seen the dying gasps of a Homeric warrior, say, as the exhalation of his soul. Psyche could exist in a disembodied state, and it is doubtful whether most early Greek philosophers thought that it could, it would have been a shadowy or ephemeral form like the denizens of Hades. Plato, 428 to 348 or 347 BCE, asked more sophisticated questions about how one can feel, think, possess knowledge and choose rightly. In his earlier writings, Plato came closer than any other ancient or medieval philosopher to advancing a dualist account like that of Descartes.
In the Phaedo, he took immortality to be an essential feature of the soul so that mortal soul is a contradiction in terms. Thus, when death comes to a man, the mortal part of him dies, but the mortal part retires at the approach of death and escapes unharmed and indestructible. But soul as immortal by definition has more in common with what is cosmic and divine than with anything in the visible realm, such as its body, for example, why Plato shows little interest in exploring its everyday operations. The soul's union with the body is not its natural state. In fact, the whole point of philosophy is to prepare the soul for its release from the prison of the body. Plato and Aristotle on Soul Plato is more forthcoming in his later works, where the concept of soul plays a major role in his explanation of moral conflict and human action. From the fact that one can be affected by two or more desires simultaneously, he infers that the soul cannot be unitary, since it is impossible for the same thing to act in opposite ways at the same time. Accordingly, in the Republic, he identifies three distinct parts of the soul, reason, nose, passion, thumos, and appetite, epithumia, and posits these as the source of conflicting desires. Reason rules of the soul with wisdom, but opposed to it is appetite, the rational part of the soul with which it loves, hungers, thirsts, and feels the flutter and titillation of other desires. Reason and appetite would remain in unending combat, but for the intervention of passion, the spirited part of the soul that helps reason subdue appetite. Plato has in mind here the experience of stealing our resolve when we angrily force ourselves to do something we don't want to do because reason has judged it to be the best course of action. What are important about this model, however, are the elevation of rationality to the dominant position in the soul and conversely the denigration of appetite as an irrational force that threatens to destroy our well-being. In the Phaedrus, Plato likens reason to a charioteer trying to control two horses, a good horse called passion, who needs no whip because he is driven by the command of reason alone and a bad horse, appetite, who is hard to control and who would run the chariot into the ditch if left unchecked. Plato saw no redeeming value for the emotions in human moral life, though anger at least could sometimes be placed in the service of reason. Aristotle 384 to 322 BCE took the study of the soul in a less speculative direction. He wrote an entire treatise on the soul as a natural phenomenon. The soul is defined as an actuality of the first kind of natural organized body that which makes the body alive and capable of performing its characteristic functions. Aristotle divides these into vegetative powers concerned with nutrition and growth, sensory powers and intellectual powers. In his border taxonomy of life forms, these correspond to the soul of plants, brute animals and human beings respectively, with the higher forms subsuming the powers of those lower in the hierarchy. Only the third capacity is relevant to the modern conception of mind, though it should be noted that this is far from being a dualist conception. Aristotle's intellect is a perfection of the organic unity of body and soul, and although he concedes that the activity of thinking is separable, impassable and unmixed, thinking cannot occur without sensory images. Greek notion of soul the Homeric poems, with which most ancient writers can safely be assumed to be intimately familiar, use the word soul in two distinguishable, probably related ways. The soul is on the one hand something that a human being risks in battle and loses in death. On the other hand, it is what at the time of death departs from the person's limbs and travels to the underworld where it has a more or less pitiful afterlife as a shade or image of the deceased person. It has been suggested that what is referred to as soul in either case is in fact thought of the same thing, something that a person can risk and lose and that after death endures as a shade in the underworld. The suggestion is plausible but cannot be verified.
In any case, once a person's soul has departed for good, the person is dead. The presence of soul therefore distinguishes a human body from a corpse. However, this is plainly not to say that the soul is thought of as what accounts for or is responsible for the activities, responses, operations and the like that constitute a person's life. Homer never says that anyone does anything in virtue of or with their soul nor does he attribute any activity to the soul of a living person. Thus, though the presence or absence of soul marks out a person's life, it is not otherwise associated with that life. Moreover, it is a striking feature of Homeric usage that in Furley's words to mention soul is to suggest death. Someone's a soul comes to mind only when their life is thought by themselves or others to be at risk. Thus, Achilles says that he is continuously risking his soul and Agenor reflects on the fact that even Achilles has just one soul. It should also be pointed out that in the Homeric poems, only human beings are said to have souls. Correspondingly, Homer never envisages shades or images of known human creatures in the underworld. These two facts taken together suggest that, in whatever precise way the soul is conceived of as associated with life, it in any case thought to be connected not with life in general, but specifically with the life of a human being. Several significant developments occurred in the ways Greek thought and spoke about the soul in the 6th and the 5th centuries. The questions about the soul that are formulated and discussed in the writings of Plato and Aristotle to some extent arise from and need to be interpreted against the background of these 6th and 5th century developments. One factor that is of central importance is the gradual loss of the Homeric connection between mentioning a person's soul and the thought that their life is vulnerable or at risk. In ordinary 5th century Greek, having soul is simply being alive, hence the emergence at about this time of the adjective ensouled as the standard word meaning alive which was applied not just to human beings but to other living things as well. There is some reason to think that the word soul was used in this straightforwardly positive way already in the 6th century. Tales of Miletus, who is credited with successfully predicting a solar eclipse occurring in 585 BC, reportedly attributed soul to magnets on the grounds that those magnets are capable of moving iron. Thales' thought was presumably that since it is distinctive of living things to be able to initiate movements, magnets must in fact be alive or in other words ensouled. Thus, while Homer spoke of soul only in the case of human beings in 6th and 5th century usage, soul is attributed to every kind of living thing. What is in place then at this time is the notion that soul is what distinguishes that which is alive from that which is not. However, it is not just that soul is said to be present in every living thing. It is the case that an increasingly broad range of ways of acting and being acted on is attributed to the soul. Thus, it has come to be natural by the end of the 5th century to refer pleasure taken in food and drink as well as sexual desire to the soul. People are said, for example, to satisfy their souls with rich food and the souls of gods and men are claimed to be subject to sexual desire. In contexts of intense emotion or crisis, feelings like love and hate, joy and grief, anger and shame are associated with the soul. Oedipus says that his soul laments the misery of a city and its inhabitants. Moreover, the soul is also importantly connected with boldness and courage, especially in battle. Courageous people are said, for instance, in Herodotus and Thucydides, to have enduring or strong souls. In the Hippocratic text, Airs, Waters, Places, the soul is thought of as the place of courage or as the case may be its opposite. In the case of lowland inhabitants, courage and endurance are not in their souls by nature but must be instilled by law. Similarly, in benign climates, men are fleshy, ill-jointed, 
moist, without endurance and weak in soul. The connection between the soul and characteristic like boldness and courage in battle is plainly an aspect of the noteworthy 5th century development whereby the soul comes to be thought of as a source of bearer of moral qualities such as, for instance, temperance and justice. In Pericles' funeral oration that Thucydides includes in his account of Peloponnesian War, he says that those who know most clearly the sweet and the terrible, yet do not as a result turn away from danger, are rightly judged strongest with regard to the soul. It indicates a semantic extension whereby soul comes to denote a person's moral character, often but not always with special regard to qualities such as endurance and courage. While the connection with courage is obvious in a number of texts, there are other texts in which the soul is the bearer of other admirable qualities such as Euripidean fragment that speaks of the desire characteristic of a soul that is just, temperate and good. Hippolytus in Euripides' play named after him describes himself as having a virgin soul obviously to evoke his abstinence from sex. In Pindar's second Olympian, salvation is promised to those who keep their souls from unjust acts. The last two texts mentioned may well be influenced by Orphic and Pythagorean beliefs about the nature and immortality of the soul to which we will turn in due course. But it would be a mistake to think that the moralization of the soul wholly depended on Orphic and Pythagorean speculation. It would at the very least be to disregard the soul's connection with courage in poetry, the historians and in Hippocratic writings. The 5th century Greek notion of soul To educated 5th century speakers of Greek, it would have been natural to think of qualities of soul as accounting for and being manifested in a person's morally significant behavior. Pericles acts courageously and Hippolytus temperately because of the qualities of their souls from which such actions have a strong tendency to flow and their actions express and make evident the courage, temperance and the like that characterize their souls. Once we are in a position proper Early to appreciate connection between soul and moral character that must already have been felt to be natural at this stage, it should come as no surprise that the soul is also taken to be something that engages in activities like thinking and planning. If the soul is, in some sense, responsible for courageous acts, for instance, it is only to be expected that the soul also grasps what, in the circumstances, courage calls for and how, at some suitable level of detail, the courageous act must be performed. Thus, in a speech of Antiphon, the jury is urged to take away from the accused the soul that planned the crime. In striking juxtaposition of the ideas of life soul and of soul as responsible for practical thought. Somewhat similarly, in Sophoclean fragment, someone says that a kindly soul with just thoughts is a better inventor than any sophist. Moreover, it is easy to see that there are connections between familiar uses of soul in emotional contexts and attributions to the soul of cognitive and intellectual activities and achievements. There is, after all, no clear-cut and manifest difference between, say, being in the emotional state of fear and having a terrifying thought or perception. When Oedipus' soul laments or Ajax' soul is bitten by dishonor, emotion obviously goes hand in hand with cognition and if it is natural to refer the one to the soul, there should be nothing puzzling about attributions to it of the other. Thus, in non-philosophical Greek of the 5th century, the soul is treated as the bearer of moral qualities and also as responsible for practical thought and cognition. 
From Homer to the end of the 5th century, the word soul undergoes remarkable semantic expansion in the course of which it comes to be natural not only to speak of soul as what distinguishes the living from the dead and the animate from the inanimate, but also to attribute to the soul a wide variety of activities and responses, cognitive as well as emotional, and to think of it as the bearer of such virtues as courage, temperance and justice. As a result of these developments, the language made available something that Homeric Greek lacked, a distinction between body and soul. Thus, the Hippocratic author of airs, waters and places writes of endurance in body and soul. Antiphon says of a defendant who is sure of his innocence that though his body may surrender, his soul saves him from its willingness to struggle through knowledge of its innocence. For the guilty, on the other hand, even a strong body is to no avail since his soul fails him, believing the vengeance coming to him is for his impetus. Homer, by contrast, knows and speaks of a whole lot of different sources and bearers of psychological predicates, but lacks a word to pick out the soul as a single item to which the predicates in question can, in some way or the other, be referred and which can be distinguished from and in suitable context contrasted with the body. Now, please try to answer some questions. What are the three parts of soul according to Plato. How did Aristotle agree with Plato on the concept of soul? What is the structure of soul according to various philosophers? What is the Pythagorean belief on the soul? What is Plato's strategy over the study of soul? How do Homeric poems perceive on soul? What change occurred to the word soul by the end of the 5th century? How did the educated Greek scholars of the 5th century narrate the soul? Now, you may go through the reference books for further reading. The Pre-Socratic Philosophers, edited by G. S. Kirk, J. E. Raven and M. Schofield, Cambridge University Press, Cambridge, 1983. Plato Complete Works, edited by J. M. Cooper and D. S. Hutchinson, Indianapolis, Hackett, 1997. The Complete Works of Aristotle, edited by J. Barnes, Princeton University Press, Princeton, 1984. The Cambridge History of Hellenistic Philosophy, edited by K. Algra, J. Barnes, J. Mansfield and M. Schofield, Cambridge University Press, Cambridge, 1999. Hellenistic Philosophy of Mind by J. E. Annas, University of California Press, 1992. Reason and Emotion by J. M. Cooper, Princeton University Press, Princeton, 1999. Hope this session was enriching. Thank you for watching today's program. Goodbye.